Okay, welcome to lecture 5.2. Today we're going to call, talk about something called a holonomic constraint. Um, won't be using Jupyter much today, so most of it will be here just by uh, the tablet. Okay, so before we get to what a holonomic constraint is, let's just uh, open up with some general collection of thoughts here. So um, we've been using uh, so-called configuration variables to describe um, the configuration of our multi-body systems, and you've already been doing that. Okay, for example, um, in your current homework, you're looking at uh, a rolling disk. Let me draw that at an angle. And um, this rolling disk is described by a few configuration variables. For example, maybe you have a yaw alpha, right? It's a function of time. That is a configuration variable. You also maybe have uh, uh, a roll angle here. Call that gamma, also a function of time. And uh, the uh, rotation of the wheel is another potential just draw here, here, so we could call that um, beta. So in this case, alpha, function of time, gamma, also a function of time, and beta are configuration variables. For this rolling disk. Okay, so we've already been doing that. We've been describing the configuration of, of your uh, systems uh, so far with variables such as this. And in general, that is, um, uh, those are configuration variables. So any system in general can be described as a collection of points. So um, each point in 3D space can be described by three configuration variables. And the most obvious uh, three to choose are um, three Cartesian configuration variables. So an x, y, z coordinate for each point. So we call those Cartesian coordinates for a Cartesian coordinate system. If I have uh, such a uh, reference frame with some unit vectors, let me make those a new color. All right, so I have uh, three unit vectors. I'm going to have a point point here, um, O, 
which is fixed in this reference frame A. And, and then if I locate a point P relative to O that can have configuration or can be, um, it can move in with respect to time in this uh, system. Actually, let me draw it uh, here. Then the location of this can be described by three Cartesian coordinates. So we'd have um, a x of t here, a y of t, oops, still on dotted lines, x of t, y of t, and then a z of t would locate that point relative to O. So um, if I specify what z, x, and y of t are, um, and I uh, make those, instead of time varying, constant, I can lock or fix the location of P with respect to O in the reference frame A here. And this idea is uh, how we constrain P so it can't have motion in some of these um, directions. So we can constrain the configuration variables. by specifying some of these coordinates to be constants. And um, I'm just going to say specifying some of these coordinates. You can specify them to be constants, or we can make relationships between these coordinates such that um, there's other types of constraints, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll give that an example. So, for a simple example here, I'm going to have enough room. Let's go to a new page. So, for example, for this single point, um, if I were to make that z of t equal to zero for all time, then um, the point P would be constrained uh, to the xy plane, to motion in the xy plane. Okay, so then we have a planar motion point with that constraint. And uh, if, if we were to set x of t equal to y of t equal to z of t, all equal to zero, um, the point P is fully constrained and fixed in A. Fixed in a, yeah. Okay, so those are very simple constraint equations. We set x, y, and z to some constant value, in this case zero, and we can put constraints on the system. Um, so if we have um, a collection of points, I'm gonna say a collection of v points, then it requires three V constraints 
to fix all points in, Euc in this Euclidean space. So for every point, we've got a. Uh, if we want to constrain the motion, with, for example, with the x, z, y, z equals zero, then we need to have three v constraints. So let's take an example here. And we'll have three points. P one. P2, P3, and also point zero, not zero, point O, um, which is fixed in a reference frame A. Um, and these are not fixed in A. at least uh, as we start. So if I uh, have my 3D unit vectors here associated with A, uh, and I'll do AX, AY, AC. And then we have these three points that are not unconstrained. It can be in any location here. So I'll just randomly plop them in. And then we'll say that there's some point O that's fixed in A. And we'll just draw it there for convenience. But I have these uh, three points that I can locate, uh, each with three Cartesian coordinates. And um, if I want to constrain all of these coordinates, then I'm going to need a total of nine constraints. So constrain all points. Uh, we need three times V. We have three points. So that's nine constraints if we want to lock down all of them. So I'm going to add some constraints sequentially, and we're going to uh, arrive at some kind of uh, system here that has constraints involved. And I'm not going to add uh, nine, but let's just see where we get. So first, constrain all the points. Let's constrain all the points to move in a plane. And in this case, we'll do in the xy plane. And to do so, we can write constraints like so. So if I have uh, the point P1 with respect to O, and I write my position vector to that, and I then dot it with the, sorry, A, Z, then I get a scalar equation that um, will let me specify that that is zero. So that's constraint equation one. Right. And then similarly for the other points, we'll lock them into the xy plane in the same way. Constraint equation two and constraint equation three. All right, so there's three constraint equations, and now I have uh, just, and we can look now in a 2D plane with our AX and AY, and then points P1, 
P2, P3, moving somewhere around on that plane. All right, so now I want to add some more constraints. And I want to constrain these points to have a certain distance between them. So what I want to do is I'm going to set the distance that has to be fixed between P1 and P2, and then also P2 and P3. So I can write a new constraint equations here. So if I take the vector from P1 to P2, and I take its magnitude, and then I'm going to set that to a distance that is not varying in time called LB. That's going to be constraint equation four. And then similarly, I'll look constraint equation five. And I'm going to constrain P2 and P3 to always have a distance LC. Okay? So LC and LB, they're constant distances. And we have uh, two more constraint equations there. That leaves us with a system that looks something like this. So now I'll draw a fixed link line between these points that we constrained with distance, and this was LB and LC. So points P1, P2, and P3 can all move around in the plane, but now they're connected and they have to stay within this uh, distance of the other one. So we can move them around the plane and swirl these around, um, but they'll always stay that distance with those two new constraints. All right, let's introduce another constraint. So now constrain, let me put my O back there, constrain um, P1 to be fixed in A. And the simplest way to do that is uh, let's just say that the vector from Z O to P1 um, I could say the distance is equal to zero um, but I can also uh, say the Cartesian distance and the X and the Y here is also equal to zero so if I say that that's going to be constraint six and then constraint seven. I have that. All right. So what does that look like? So I can copy this to make that a little quicker. Um, copy paste. So we have this, and if I grab just this link, then I've now, boom, stuck that there. Okay, so I have uh, P1 now fixed it up. And then um, P2 and P3 can still move around, but they still have to stay connected um, via these distances. All right, so we're gonna introduce one more constraint. New page. So I'm going to constrain a point P3 
to have no uh, motion possible in the vertical direction, the y direction. And so that would look like r from p3, and I can say the vector from r from p3 dotted with the ay must be to zero for a constraint number eight. And at this point, we now have something that looks like this, actually. Okay, so this is P1, and O, P2, and P3. All right. At this point, we actually have sort of a, a mechanism. Um, there can be some uh, motion here. Right. We can send P2 in a circle around P1, and if we do so, then we get this horizontal motion of P3 also. And so what we end up with, if we only make these eight constraints, we have a, uh, a little planar crank slider mechanism. Um, but if you notice, um, if I set, uh, if we move P2, right, P3 is going to move also. So, and if I move P3, then P2, right? So there's a, a dependency here on, um, on things. I can't uh, independently locate P3 and P2. Um, they have to follow these eight constraints of the system. And uh, I can really only have one um, thing I can change. And um, I can either change the port, uh, location of P2 or the location of P3, but I can't change both independently. So um, what this tells us is that we started with three times three equals nine Cartesian coordinates to describe these three points. And we've introduced um, it was three plus two plus two plus one, all the constraint equations that got us to a total of eight scalar constraint equations. Okay, so eight scalar equations, nine coordinates, and if you know, we see there's um, one or, you know, point we can move at this point. So, what this implies then, and uh, is that uh, we are left with a single independent. Oh, my program just crashed. Please, you think it'll be? It'll revive itself. I don't know. This hasn't happened yet. Restore file. We got something here. Promising, promising, promising. Wow. Didn't lose anything. Let me save that. 
Um, where do I save these? Okay, so we're left with a single independent. Uh, boop, boop. Independent coordinate. Um, and that single value is calculated. We're going to say that uh, n equals 3 v minus m. Right, see, I'll introduce these variables. We have uh, eight constraint equations, and then we had three times three. I think it was nine. And we do our math. We get n equals one. And that's why we have one single coordinate left that allows uh, the configuration to fully be specified for this mechanism. Okay, so this n uh, tells us how many independent coordinates we have that can fully specify the configuration, and we can figure that out by taking the full um, number of Cartesian coordinates that describe all the points in motion in the system minus any constraints we introduce to get that one coordinate that's left. Okay. So, in general, um, I'll just summarize what I just said. A set of V particles or points can be constrained by uh, capital M constraints, leaving n equals 3 v minus m independent configuration variables, or, co or coordinates in our case. All right, and um, the constraints take this general form. So I'll write a, uh, a vector function, call it fh of some Cartesian coordinates x, y, z, 1 through uh, x, y, z, v right, for the z coordinates. And I include time here equals 0. So we can write uh, this vector function where um, f of h um, has uh, dimensionality capital M, right, for the number of constraints. So there can be as many equations in this vector function that are functions of these variables uh, as the number of constraints we have. The uh, time that I wrote there can be um, explicit in these equations for certain uh, types of constraints which we haven't demonstrated and I, and I, and I want um, and you may see uh, some terminology if time is explicit in this equation, um, 
you know, actually before I introduce that word, I uh, forgot to, to name this. So these constraints take the general form. These are called holonomic constraints. Okay, so we just put a word on that. Holonomic constraints um, are constraints that are associated with the configuration. Okay, so we only have um, configuration variables in here. Right, there's no derivatives of these variables. They're strictly in terms of the angles, positions, um, and in this case, just the Cartesian coordinates. So these are called holonomic constraints, and that's what this chapter is uh, primarily about. All right, and now I want to say that if time is explicit in these equations, then um, there are uh, a couple other funny words that are used to label that. So a explicit is called a rayonomic, holonomic constraint. And if it, if time is implicit, meaning no time is here and it's just implicit in the x, uh, in the x, y, and z's, which is the typical case, uh, then you call this a scleronomic holonomic constraint, if I can write it. Scler ronomic. All right, and that's those two uh, words are not uh, particularly important, but there's some names that are given to these forms of the holonomic constraints. Okay, so that's the basic idea here. We're going to have holonomic constraints that will constrain configuration of a system. And they take this general form if we think about a collection of points that have uh, Cartesian coordinates that we've used to describe them. So, but there's going to be, we're not really going to use the Cartesian coordinates in this, in this course. There's a better way, um, simpler way to uh, handle this so we don't have to go through the whole process that I just went through. So let's talk about that. Um, most constraints can be implicitly managed or defined um, if we describe our system initially with the configuration we desire. So let's come back to this crank slider. Go to a new page. I uh, will use the same setup we had before. I've got a reference frame A. But I'm going to just start with a planar drawing. We know this is a planar mechanism. And, oops. And let's add a sketch of our mechanism. Actually, I'll put a little slider block here, typically drawn. Add our points. Okay, so I've got my crank slider mechanism. Let's label our points. We've got P1, O, the same spot. P2 and P3. All right, so I've drawn it already sort of configured uh, as I want. And now, um, and, and let's, let's label two bodies here. Call that B. 
call that C. B is a link, C is a link, and then they have those distances, uh, or links, LB and LC. So instead of using the Cartesian coordinates of the points involved, um, we know that P2 right, makes this circle around P1, so maybe it's more interesting or more useful to describe uh, an angle here. Right? So I'll make a Q1 there, and um, the slider, right? it moves back and forth on this A axis. I'm going to call um, that Q3. So this distance here, Q3. And um, I can also talk about maybe right this angle of uh, the link C with a relative to B. Let's give that a angle too, because it's easier to describe with an angle. So I'm going to call that Q2. Okay. So here I use two angles and a distance, Q1, Q2, and Q3. We could calculate the Cartesian coordinates of P2 and P3 uh, from these angles, so there's some relation. But I'm just using an alternative set of configuration variables to describe that. Okay. We would call this kind of uh, system a, um, uh, a closed kinematic loop. So this is a so-called closed kinematic loop. Uh, and that is because, I'll just say called, called a closed kinematic loop because the vector, if I take the vector from P1 to P3, it must equal the vector on the other side of this loop, which is the vector from P1 to P2, plus the vector from P3 uh, from P2, vector 2P3 from P2. Okay, so this equation here is uh, a loop equation, right? It, it, it shows us that we sort of have this closed um, triangle in this case that is defined by this relationship okay and anytime you have a closed kinematic loop like this we're gonna have to deal with some constraints um, to ensure that it moves as we would like so this equation describes holonomic constraints of this configuration. Okay. Um, so how do we deal with this? We want to um, figure out what these holonomic constraint equations are in terms of these new configuration variables that we've introduced, Q1, Q2, and Q3. And I'll say too that, um, I'm gonna say that we have uh, uh, capital N configuration variables. Where n equals 3 in our case, to give that a, a variable. Okay, how do we deal with this? Um, the key thing is that we uh, want to uh, open this loop. Okay, so the closed loop is a problem. Uh, we want to pick one of the points, in this case, cut it there, separate, and then we can describe uh, each side of this equation independently and then try to solve it, okay? So um, let me copy this. 
and I want to erase some of it. Let's get rid of that. Yeah, I think that's sufficient. And um, I'm going to erase this too. I'm going to draw now this uh, system disconnected at point P3. So we have uh, a P3 up here. And I'll call this P3 star, right? because we disconnected it and then I'll have P3 here and now I can form a two vector equations one for each side of this kinematic loop so let's write those down um, the easy one is the vector from P3 to P3 from P1 and that is simply Q3 in the AX direction. And then the other one, I'll have uh, P2 from P1 plus the vector uh, P3 star to P2, P2 to P3 star. Those two pieces, um, I didn't draw on here, but uh, AX, uh, BX is along the B link and CX is along the C link. So we can then write um, LB times BX and then plus LC along CX to get those. So these two vector uh, pieces, they must equate for our loop equation to hold true. All right. and, and that means uh, that I can then write something like this vector equation minus LB BX minus LC CX all equals to zero and this here is our uh, you know, vector form of our holonomic equation So um, holonomic constraints are scalar equations, so we need to uh, turn this into some scalar equations. Let's do that. Um, we're in a planar system there, so we have a vector equation that fundamentally has uh, only components or in the plane, so we're going to we can arrive at two constraint equations. Um, we could, uh, for example, take that vector that we wrote. Um, Q3 AX uh, minus LB BX minus LC CX. And if I dot that in the AX direction, set that equal to zero, um, this is saying that uh, P3 and P3 star um, must. have uh, the same a the same x value right, or same x coordinate in the a frame and then um, I can also um, dot this In the AY direction, and uh, this uh, would say that P3 star um, must lie on the x-axis. Right. So I could I could do those two dot products, and that's going to give me two scalar equations 
Okay, we see Q3 here, um, and then Q2 and Q1 are sort of implicit in these uh, the re rotation relationships between B uh, and C and A. Okay, um, an alternative to that, you can do this, uh, no problem, that gives you the right equations, uh, but for the purposes of doing this all in pencil and paper, um, we could also do this. I can write so I'm going to express this equation only in the B frame right because a is really I can express a relatively easy in B and also C relatively easy in B and uh, if I do so I get to write out this equation uh, all expressed in B so I'll say that Q3, um, I believe this is going to be the cosine of Q1, it's going to be x, and then minus uh, Q3 sine of Q1 in the by direction. And so that's our Q3 ax component. We leave uh, LB bx alone, and then express uh, C into B would give me a, a minus LB cosine Q2 BX and minus LC sine Q2 BY, right? All right, now that it's all expressed in B, I can um, just take the measure numbers of the bx to form my first equation and the measure numbers of by to form my second equation. So if I take the bx measure numbers, then I'll have q3 cos q1 minus lb uh, and then minus, and that's supposed to be lc. Minus LC cos Q2 must equal to zero. And then if I take VY, I can do uh, minus Q3 sine Q1. Um, and then minus LC sine Q2 equals to zero. And right, so these are two scalar holonomic constraints. Okay. So um, recall that we started with n capital N equals three coordinates. That we introduce Q1, Q2, and Q3. And we now have um, M equals two uh, constraints. And we can find that. Um, that is equivalent to what we've done before in the sort of longer method. Uh, that uh, n, the number of independent coordinates, is going to be n minus m. 3 minus 2 equals to 1. Uh, so we have n, little n, independent coordinates. And in our case, uh, we need to choose Q1, Q2, or Q3 to be that independent coordinate. Um, so uh, if we choose, we can choose any one. If we choose Q1 to be independent, Uh, 
then Q2 and Q3 would be dependent on Q1. Dependent on Q1. Okay? So this is an equivalent formulation as what we, as, as what we did with um, the Cartesian coordinates of every point in the system. But now we've uh, started with these uh, different types of coordinates, um, two angles and a distance. We've established two constraint equations. Um, and we end up with one independent coordinate uh, for our system that we can specify and it'll tell a configuration of the system uh, at any point in time. All right, so similarly we can write this vector function but this time only of q1, q2, and q3, right? And then this would be a, um, a scleronomic, right? Since uh, t is independent. Um, equal to zero where uh, we have two equations so FH is in the uh, real domain here of uh, 2. What does that look like? Well, we make a column vector equal to a column vector of 0 and we put our expressions Q3 and then I'll just use a shorthand notation si cosine of 1 uh, sorry cosine of q1 minus lb and uh, minus lc uh, cosine of q2 and then I can put uh, q3 as our second equation uh, minus q3 times uh, sine of q1 minus lc times sine of q2 right. So that is our two sets of two, two constraint equations that we can just write in matrix form. So why do we do this? Well, note that we only need two constraints. instead of 8 as we had before when we only looked at this more general collection of points. So that's potentially nice, right? We have to form less constraint equations. Um, and this is because we choose these coordinates q1, q2, and q3. And we have the freedom to choose whatever coordinates we want to describe this, but these um, are potentially a little nicer than trying to describe the Cartesian coordinates of every point. And then we had also some constraints that are sort of implicit to our definition of our crank slider system. So that's nicer. And um, we come to the same conclusion uh, that uh, one independent coordinate fully describes the configuration. Hmm, Zernal does not like me today. I'm writing too much. I guess it wants me to use Jupiter. Okay, okay, okay. Impress that it, uh, it's not broken. 
All right, one independent, so I'm saying because one independent uh, coordinate. Fully describes the configuration. And we can choose Q1, Q2, or Q3 for that independent coordinate. Or right, Q3. Can't choose them all. So this brings me then to the last uh, sort of the closing uh, idea. Um, there exists some coordinates Q1 and these are functions of time to Q little n that are functions of the Cartesian coordinates that also uniquely describe the configuration of the system. Um, and these little n in coordinates are independent. Independent coordinates that minimize the number of constraints needed to describe the system. in coordinates, little n, we give them a special name. They are called generalized coordinates. The set, any given system can have uh, an infinite number of generalized coordinates. Right, and you get to choose those, but they have to um, be independent, right, of each other, and um, they minimize the number of constraints needed to describe the system. So any coordinates that fit those two criteria can be generalized coordinates, and uh, we'll find out that um, the uh, that this is going to be quite nice, right? If we choose nice coordinates for our system, um, the resulting equations of motion are going to be simpler. And we don't have to think about um, uh, unnecessary coordinates, or un and there will also be uh, consequences for having to think about unnecessary uh, forces and other details, which we'll learn about. But in general, you're going to want to try to describe your system in these generalized coordinates. Um, you can always take the points uh, like we did and formally go through and find and add all of the constraint equations um, to make sure you know, sort of get down to some key ones. Um, 
and to help you sort of formally do that. But typically, you think about this system, how it moves, and you try to make reasonable judgments yourself on uh, which coordinates to choose. And uh, this is a bit of an art, right? You map these systems out in your mind, think about how they move, and whether uh, if I, uh, how many different coordinates might I need, and what are the simplest ones to describe the, the system. And then you uh, arrive at these independent coordinates uh, and a minimal number of constraint equations to describe the system. Okay, so anything else I want to say? <laughs> Yeah, so for the crank slider, um, if we select Q1 as the independent coordinate of the three, then Q1 is our generalized coordinate. Okay. Um, and uh, Q2 2 and Q3 are not generalized coordinates. Okay. Um, and I think that's it. Okay. So that is uh, two key concepts here that we have these ideas of uh, holonomic constraint equations. These specify uh, how we constrain the configuration of some system. And uh, if we choose generalized coordinates that such that the coordinates are independent and that we have minimal number of constraints, um, we can call them generalized coordinates. And these generalized coordinates are going to be quite useful in the coming lessons. All right. I think that's it for today. I'll stop.